All right, talk to me about how... Uh, how you did. Deformed I am. So you scored a <laughs> 64%, which sounds worse than it actually is. Yeah, it's actually not a bad score. Yeah. Um, I think I've never seen somebody really get below it, above a 260, really. I believe it's 265 is like I've ever the, seen. Yeah, so Scordia has a moderate risk. Um, so It's not bad for someone who's not <laughs> doing anything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, you're moderate risk for just hanging out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you didn't have that many loss of balance, but um, what they're going to start doing is recording your, um, we call it like a loss of pelvic control. Mm -hmm. So I think it tells you kind of when I... Yeah, so poor pelvic control right or left. So that's any time that the hip is kind of like dipping down mm -hmm. or you're kind of getting that rotational compensation. So that's going to start to be a deduction, I think, sometime in the future. Yeah, it's like the next update. The next update, um, along with what we talked about like, with the plank degrees. So you only had one loss of balance where you had actually put your other foot down, but you had um, that loss of pelvic control with a lot of the single leg stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and limb symmetry is 87%. Um, ideally, Usually it'd be a little higher than that. Oh, really? Yeah, it's a little low. Yeah, it's a little low. Oh, um, kind of what you mentioned before about how you felt that your left side was a bit weaker. Right. So right. that kind of yeah. shows it in the numbers there. Instead of just saying it's weaker, we know it's 87% you know, it. of yeah. the, other, the other side. Got it. Um, so planes were pretty good. Um, so it tells you kind of how long you maintain that within that 10 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then below that it tells you kind of how far you deviated from it. So you're front planks and your planks, on, you actually set your planks on the right felt easier. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got better scores there. And then here you deviated three degrees outside of flexion extension, okay. meaning you went from like this position to this position, um, but only for five seconds. So you were able to hold it for 55 seconds. So that's pretty good. Um, squat. This is actually, you can see this pretty clearly in the video. You have like a weight shift onto one side. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is telling you that you kind of shift over onto your right side, mm -hmm. probably because it's your more dominant side, your stronger mm -hmm. side. Um, and it talks about like your tongue flexion and um, your 10 degrees shifted over onto the right side. And then it tells you the actual measurements for each squat. Mm -hmm. So you can see, I mean, you're pretty consistent with your forward flexion with mm -hmm. each squat, um, but your weight shifting side to side was like a little, a little bit scattered. Um, and it, it takes out kind of like the most severe. So for the most part, you were shifted onto the right side, but a little less severe than it looks, so you're kind of moderately shifted. And, and what are and the so sort of the implications of having that type of comp overcompensation? So this, is, this is showing, just from looking real quickly, a lot of flexion, mm -hmm. which means um, we want these numbers to be less than 30. So basically it's showing, if I go down to my squat with good neutral spine here, where I'm, you know, my, I'm not arching my back a whole lot, right? What you're doing as far as when it shows these higher numbers greater than 30, instead of a neutral, you're coming into this position. Got it. And basically it shows one, weakness. Mm -hmm. It shows two, possibly immobility of the hip mm -hmm. to where you're gonna go down as far as your hip allows. Right. And then if you wanna go lower, your right. pelvis is gonna do the rest. Right. So it shows weakness in that you can't maintain core yeah. control. Right. Immobility in, you know, in that. Mm -hmm. Your body's gonna follow you know, the movement right. yeah. where yeah. movement is available. And most of the time, it's if it's an impairment, it's gonna come from a place that we don't want movement to be. Right. In your case, it's the lumbar spine right. in your pelvis. Um, so we want to keep these. And it's not bad. Um, Thirty-seven degrees. It's, no, it's negligible. But you know, the forty-one, the forty-six, the you, know, you got a fifty-one up here. Yeah. So that's, you know, in, that's injury time. Exactly. So yeah. I mean, if, if you're flexing your back into that loaded position like that, if you're in the squat, that's basically the mechanism that we see for back injuries. Got it. Is I was bending over and, and uh, twisted and went to pick something up and felt a. I mean, you're in that flexed movement, and then you add a rotation or you add an external load, and that's the mechanism of injury for any type of disc or ligament damage into your low back. Exactly. So when we train these, when we're training these guys, say we're training with me, we focus a lot on your on your squatting technique, just because if say you're a high school blues athlete, you're doing a lot of you know back squats, high bar, low bar and you're getting into a into a loaded position with your back into that little bit of flexion, serious risk of damage. Right. That. That's what we see a lot with our athletes is they're either super, super, you know, arched in their low back mm -hmm. or they're super flexed in their low back. Mm -hmm. And getting away with it so long, but then they wonder why, you know, they're getting one-sided leg pain or one-sided low back pain. It's probably, you know, when we're at the naked eye, I might not have seen 42 degrees. But on here, I can see 42 degrees. So right. that's why the numbers give us a good idea. So then when you, you know, if you're squatting and we do this again, and your score isn't much better, but 
you got rid of these 51s and 48s and you're right around that 31 degree, I'd be happy with that, right. you know? So, um, and then the lateral shift, kind of like what um, Sarah was saying as far as, usually that means that you're loading to a, to your more dominant side, your stronger side, it's just neuromuscular, that's what you want to do, is heavy on that on that good side, so um, that's kind of the deviation that you see with the, with the squat. Yeah, and I noticed that even just in your video that you're kind of offloading to one What did Krista just say? Um, she's starting Grant. Grant, okay, we'll yeah. back. Um, so single leg squats, um, same thing, squared out of 30. Um, what we kind of really look at here with the hops and the squat is how far your knee is kind of deviating in this way mm -hmm. and how fast it's moving side to side. Okay. Um, so a lot of what we see here is really high speeds kind of with that landing and um, normative speed here for a landing is under 100 degrees and you were kind of like just there with that left side. Okay. So if you look, you were kind of, your knee was wiggling in and out of a varus valgus position twice as fast on the left side as it did on the right side. Woo. Yeah, which I mean, that's Dangerous. almost perfectly double. Yeah. Um, here you are a little bit more symmetrical with just a single leg squat, but with the hops, you know, that puts you two times at a risk of injury on the left side versus right. the right side. Right. Um, his speed was almost perfectly doubled on his wow. poor go. side versus his good side. Um, and then again, it just measures. It allows you a certain degree. I think it's 10 degrees or seven. It might be exactly seven degrees before it starts to really deduct you with five, that I think. five mm -hmm. in and out. Um, so you were kind of just flirting with that here with how far your knee kind of collapses in. Okay. Um, and then it also measures, we call it tibial inclination, but basically it's how far your knee is kind of coming forward over the ankle. Okay. And um, that's the exact movement that the ACL resists. Mm -hmm. So if you think if you're really kind of stretching out the ACL and stressing that with a hot a hop, yeah. you have all your body weight seven times coming right. down on the ACL. Um, yeah, the big the big takeaways from the single leg ones are the, the degree of excursion <clears throat> of the knee side to side, mm -hmm. as well as how fast it's happening. Right. You know, your ligaments and, and everything connected tissue-wise and, and the knee responds to, um, we call it like a creep. So it's just, you know, you take a piece of gum and stretch it out, as well as the velocity of what you do it. So naturally, if you apply a, a hard force, meaning a lot of excursion at a high rate, right. like a twig, you yeah. know, you're, you're doing this very, very slowly, nothing, but if I do that same force yeah. quickly, that's kind of how it responds. So, yeah. um, and you know, some people doesn't necessarily mean that you're at risk to injure yourself, but it does show weakness, mm -hmm. instability, inefficient movements, mm -hmm. and that's kind of where the performance aspect comes into play. Where if you need to be doing something cutting laterally, and you don't have good kind of that negative force to be able to change direction, you're gonna be slower. You're gonna step behind. Right. So, even though it's showing us as far as typically when we do this clinically. We're, we're afraid of injury, but even just from a performance standpoint, if you don't have good control of your knee, your jumping's gonna be bad, right. your plyometric strength is bad, and that's kind of where what we get with the test from like a high level athlete like yourself, if you're coming in to just be trained. Right. You know, obviously it's, you know, you, and your numbers aren't bad enough to where I'd be considering injury, but you can see the, the asymmetry mm -hmm. in your movements, and that's not good either. Right. And then um, same thing with single leg hop. You had, kind of just on that line with that valgus, that inward rotation of the knee. But here you can see you're at 14 degrees, double on the left side of the right side wow. with varus. And a lot of times what we, the reason that you kind of score high with the varus, varus is when your knee comes out this way. Mm -hmm. But what you were doing on the left side is when you were landing, you couldn't stabilize with that leg and you were coming up like this. Mm -hmm. So that, that right side was kind of hiking up and right. that's kind of what you will see in that score. Yeah, that'll, so that'll pick up a varus, a varus your, your shift is to the outside. Okay. Yeah. So um, that, but again, you were double, double speed and double of that various movement on the left side compared to the right. The hot plant, so that's the forward, back, side, side. And again, on the left, almost double with that kind of loss of balance outside. Um, and then the speed was a little bit more symmetrical than just the, the vertical hops. But um, again, we like to say that under 100 and you were over that on the left side. Um, and then even here, you could see the right side, you had more of that valgus movement and a lot of times you see that with weaker glutes on the right side. You did say your glutes were burning, so that could also be <laughs> just fatigue. Yeah. But, you know, if you're fatigued and you're hopping, there we go. And then your ankle range of motion was right where it should be. So Great. that's good. But yeah, so that's kind of like how we break it down and how we assess. Yeah. And the, ankle, the ankle movement's kind of the tease, what I was saying before about range of motion, weakness, whatever it is. If, 
if you have poor ankle mobility, right. that's going to affect you up the kinetic chain. If I, so I have pretty poor ankle mobility. So when I when I squat, I tend to flex at my trunk. I have to when I lift, I have to make sure I really maintain a good neutral spine because I lack the ankle mobility coming forward to keep myself kind of in a good position. So what I have to do is I have to kind of bend forward at my trunk mm -hmm. a bit more to do a, a, a normal squat. Right. So this is when training comes in. Like I typically do low bar back squats because I can't get myself into the proper vertical position. Right. So that allows us to tease out, oh, are you coming forward at your trunk into that flex movement mm -hmm. because you have poor ankle mobility? Mm -hmm. And you don't, you have good ankle mobility. That makes me think that it's up your kinetic chain. Got it. Probably more immobility in the, hip, in the hips or weakness in the glutes or core. Yeah, so, so it's kind of, it is a, a bit all encompassing as far as when you look at the whole big picture of what we can kind of look at and tease out and train. This allows you to diagnose so much quicker. Yes. Yeah. Ridic it's ridiculous. The only thing that took long I'm, was I'm, me running to the printer to get that out for you. I've and never, I've never had a, think about this, like, so I've played in seven countries, I've played for the US national team, I was, ACC Player of the Year at Wake Forest, all that. I've never had all that. Uh, imagine if I had this as a kid. I mean, right. very first time. It's great. So like now I and other uh, you know it, we I talked to you Penn about it. Um, we've had people from you know, I've had athletes from Saint Joe's, right? yeah St. Joe's uh, St. Joe's University uh, Widener, and they're using similar things, but they're not all encompassing like this is. They're using force plates. Mm -hmm. you know, that's good. You get good feedback from force plate, but it doesn't tell me about the quality of your movement, which exactly. is what's most important. Yes. If you're, if you can load and explode, and they get that feedback, it's great. You're strong, or you're weak here and there. How's the quality of your movement though? Because if you can lift this much, or you can, you know, jump this high, Christoph was like it's just towards ACL two days ago because he can't land properly. Right. That's the that's the big take. That's it. You know what I mean? Like, you look back at all his jumps when he dunks and lands. Derek Rose, horrible lander, horrible knees. You know what I mean? Uh, the, the list goes on and on of guys with chronic knee problems or right. hip problems or back problems. Right. LeBron, phenomenal jumper and lander. Right. You see him kind of, every time he lands, he gets his second foot down quickly, he embraces mm -hmm. eccentrically, he's great at it. Derek Rose is rigid everywhere, with every single movement he does, and that's what, you're, that's what the ligaments in your knee and your hips don't respond well to is that quick translation of movements. So you get people trained into these movements better. It, you see it in performance, and in you know you can't perform if you're on the sideline hurt. Right. So direct relation with that. Anyway. And, and the thing, and the thing is, is, is it's data. Like right. how much relevant data can you get? That was good. You that we, were, we were doing similar things to this before this came out. Mm -hmm. our, our debate was, you know, where we have all this stuff already. We're looking at your two-legged squat. We're looking at your one-legged squat, and we're looking at mobility and stuff like that but it's all subjective per me. Sure. You know what I mean? What I see as a quick in and out movement of your knee, and I think that that's bad, Sarah might think that that's just okay. You know, it's, it's all kind of inner rate reliability. So this, I can test you tomorrow, Andrea inside can test you tomorrow, mm -hmm. and get the same results same because the numbers don't lie. Right. Whereas me, I'd have to say, eh, it looks okay. Oh, you're flexing your back a little bit, or you're, you know, your, your ankle mobility is okay. Right. Now I can see your ankle mobility is perfect. Your lumbar spine is just off. Right. Let's work on that. Right. You know, you're, you're coming, you have, you have good knee control. However, it's it's moving quite quickly. So yeah, let's, work, so let's you, work on plyometric movements. So you know you, I mean? Yeah, and if you don't have these, I mean, you just, like, you as a trainer, you cannot compete with the data. No, you can't compete with no this way. machine. Like, we, we've, like we've, you, we you were can, trying to do it, and you just can't. You can take someone that's almost as knowledgeable, you give them this, they become a better exactly. trainer. We took, so with, I, the reason I bring up UPenn is not, not to bash them at all, but with the, what, they're, what they're doing is, is they're taking their information from the force, from the force plate and it generates a program for them. Mm -hmm. Which is great because it kind of it uses all this stuff and then it would say like, okay, you need to do more single leg deadlifts. Mm -hmm. You need to do more balance, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Um, what, what they don't have is it doesn't tease out which is the quality movements. Mm -hmm. So we have guys from those, you know, through Penn Lacrosse. Um, I worked a lot with a, with a squash player who was having a lot of trouble mm -hmm. um, just with body awareness and being able to control himself. And in just, you know, a, a six week program got him to be, one, his, his symptoms were better. He's having a ton of knee pain, a ton of hip pain, just because no one looked at the quality of his movement. Got him on a better program. Six weeks he was playing better and feeling better. 
having her from, from sets. He was a guy who we, we saw in this clinic before all this technology, for surgery of his hip, for conservative management before that, for problems post-operatively. And we saw him this time with this, he was like a good year and a half post-op and was still having problems. This, six weeks, he was good. Whew. Two years it took, you know, before surgery, his initial recovery, and then again after, still no good, and then this, and it changed. So here's part of, so Dr. Poor and I, so I went to the Haverford School, Dr. Okay. Poor went to uh, GA. Gotcha. Yeah, we played against each other when we were younger. Um, but, I, I, you know, again, I had my career, but I have different programs that I run, uh, soccer programs, and I have, different, I have uh, club teams. Uh, my son plays with the Union Academy. So one of his Union Academy teammates went to my program. We started to talk about the fact that, you know, so many kids are getting injur injuries, mostly in their hips, groins, and lower backs. Yep. That same year, I had six of my players out. These are s four of the six will be Division I at, uh, soccer players out with lower back injuries. So I sent a few of them here uh, uh, down to Dr. Poor. And Timmy O'Hare came up. I have a few others that should have. Oh yeah, Tim. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so he, he's my player. You know, he's going to be a Division One soccer player if he wants to be. Um, so, um, you know, I, I basically said to Dr. Poor, we need to figure out how to, you know, come up with a, a system that can help these kids, you know, stay, you know, avoid injury. You know, um, and there needs to be some kind of training model that I can ba integrate into my program. Yeah. That can that can uh, that can help that, but without the data, it's really challenging. You know, it's really challenging because essentially you can't scale it without data, exactly, and you can't customize it without data. Mm -hmm. So you can have an idea about what you think people might need from a from an injury prevention standpoint, but it's still going to be different from you to you because right. your needs are going to be different. Exactly. So what this does, in my mind, is it allows you to scale and customize. And when you have those two things, you're gonna, you know. Yeah. And what's what's different from, you know, like, there's nothing that's gonna generate the program from that because that's too that's too much dynamic movement. You know, I make a program, we make a program based off of that. Sure. Because we know what each one does. Like sure. A, a train, you know, the, the training staff over at UPenn. It generates it for them. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, your valgus might be different from your valgus. Mm -hmm. You might be losing balance because of a poor perception problem in your ankle or your foot. Mm -hmm. you might be losing because of core instability. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be doing the same things. Right. You know, so just because you have. Right. Yep. So, all the all the new research from the past, even the past twenty years, but now it's just being reinforced, is that training children younger than adolescent mm -hmm. is beneficial for them. Mm -hmm. A lot of times what's negative actually is if you say you're going to do soccer year round, that's where you see overuse and burnout type symptoms. Mm -hmm. Cross training, strength training, being dynamic with their programs has shown great benefits and it's just being continuing to be reinforced. Mm -hmm. Young ages and elderly people alike, people say, well, they're over 80, let's not get them into the gym. Mm -hmm. No, get them into the gym, they respond well. Right. No goal. All those motor patterns return. A child, they need to learn those motor patterns. Other, uh, otherwise, they get to the point to where they're 16, 17, 18, and they're trying to squat and they can't right. because 18 years of compensations neurally, not just muscularly, but your body gets trained neurally to do certain things. Mm -hmm. So if I want to use my glutes, my hamstrings are going to do most of the work. Mm -hmm. That's going to give me a ton of instability at my pelvis and low back if, right. if my hamstrings are doing what my glutes should be doing. Right. And it's surprising just from if I had you do 20 single leg bridges, your hamstrings would probably be on fire. Mm -hmm. You don't train your glutes the way people should be doing it. And that's mm -hmm. something that even kids can be doing as far as just neuromuscular training. And those, right. are, those are easy, quick, three to four week results that you get neuromuscularly. Right. The strength canes, that's six to eight weeks of, of overload specific movements. But neuromuscularly, you can train that very quickly. Mm -hmm. People don't because they think, I'm gonna stun his growth plates or I'm gonna hurt him. It's not true. It's all farces and myths. Got it. So, you know, getting these kids in here young, I mean, you're seeing it now because, you know, when I was first year two years ago, to get a 14-year-old in here for surgery was like, whoa, that's crazy. Now, I mean, every single week we get a 13 or 14-year-old in here. And I think it's because people are training incorrectly. Mm -hmm. I think it's, we don't want to do strength training because you're too young. Right. Let's just beat the crap out of you by making you do all these 
sports 24 seven instead. Well, that's way worse than making them train. At least when they're training, they're in a, uh, you know, they're supervised and it's structured. On the field is contact and, and uneven surfaces and fatigue muscularly and, and cardiovascularly. So there's all these, you know, ex, you know, extra factors coming into play. Whereas in a training environment, I can be one on one with you and I know what I'm doing. Right. So I think even just a, a good structured program, just working on technique, doing simple things and, and making sure the right muscles are firing, I think is super important. I mean, think about how much that tired you out. We sometimes have our, our athletes do a full PT program right. and then we test them because most injuries happen when you're fatigued, you're compensating. So say, you know, yeah, all right, I'm gonna test you for the dorsal I'm gonna have you do 10 exercises in here. We're gonna fatigue out your core, we're gonna fatigue out your glutes, right. and then we're gonna test you to see what you look like in the last 10 minutes of the game when you're at the highest risk for injury. So right. you think you're tired after just that. Imagine if you did a full soccer workout before, or right. a full practice, or a full game, and then we tested you. Because, yeah, I mean, there's that's not, when you're at the highest risk. There's not great research as far as, you know, fourth quarter is when most injuries happen. Mm -hmm. You can't tell when someone's gonna dive into your knee or not your, you know, or, or your, your, yeah. but yeah. there's definitely a correlation between the efficiency of your body's movements and fatigue. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if more maybe non-contact injuries are happening in the fourth quarter. There's really no, you know, I can't sit here and say that there's a, a specific correlation to that, but I mean, there's definitely physiological proof that if, if I have lactic acid build up in my calf mm -hmm. and I go to explode off of it, it's not gonna fire efficiently, right. and my Achilles tendon is gonna take most of the brunt. Right. Is that the main reason why it blew? Who knows, could have been a lot of factors, but that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's why we beat you up and then make you do this, because we want to see, I want to be able to, to tell your doctor, tell your coach, he is at the best functional capacity he will be at. Mm -hmm. We drained him and he still scored a 216 and showed good, good numbers on his on his, on his virus and his, and his velocities and all that stuff. So you know, if we get you in here and, and we see some red flags, you better believe I'm not gonna recommend that you go back to your sport. Right. So that's kind of what we use it for. Excellent. Poor valgus, because you load poorly, isn't the same. Right. So it kind of goes with what you're saying also, is, is, is there's nothing generic about what we do after the season. Sure. Um, we just put together a program for the Anderson Monarchs baseball team. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with them, like a big youth, you know, like the Teeny Dragons yep. type, mm -hmm. type yeah. team. Yep. Um, and we did the whole team. We did, you know, 11 of their best players, put together a program for them. We, we did a, a a global one just because we felt that they could work out together mm -hmm. and, and do this as, as a cohesive team. Mm -hmm. But we were able to kind of take their all their data and say, okay, the majority of them are doing this, the majority of them are doing this, the majority of them have th these weaknesses. Let's make something all encompassing for them so that you know they can just do a maintenance program during their season. Sure. So it wasn't like an individualized thing, but that's an option too. Just do a team type of you know activity to where we can get the resistance bands out and they can do the same stuff together. Um, we have to toss some balls back to each other and stuff like that, so it can become a team thing to train, even though you're doing stuff for your individual body. Yep. So, um, just being dynamic with this stuff is, is great, and it gives you the opportunity to do it because it gives you so much. Fantastic. I'm impressed. Yeah. Let me go check on my my guy. Yeah. Right back. I'm impressed. Yeah. And we, I mean, like Sean said, we've we've been doing this for a while. We've actually had players that we've tested, developed a program for. Mm -hmm found out that either the coaches didn't do it or the you know the players weren't complying with it, they were, didn't really understand it, and then they come back and they're injured. We had a player come back that had an eight, Achilles rupture. That's an eight month recovery. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just had a player that um, I'm treating, he had a complete rupture of his MCL and a meniscus tear. Yeah. And we found out that he had had this program done and you know he was given the results by his coach and we gave them a program and it wasn't really followed and now I'm treating him and you know he's Feels like a he has a recruiting trip for Princeton football in a month, and his mom is trying to get him back. And I'm like, he has a torn ligament. Like, that takes months, if not up to a year, for that ligament to kind of regenerate. Right. So, you know, where a kid was thinking in a year and a half he'd be playing D1 football, well, now we're kind of just trying to get him running for his right. for his trial. So, it's I mean, you can't put a you know an ACL that could be up to 12 months. That's an entire year, and it, I mean. Not only do you have ligament that has to regenerate, but now you have all the compensations and the deficits from being unactive for five months trying to rehab your knee. Sure. Yeah, it's awesome. It's really, it's been great. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. So um, we'll, um, I'll contact my boss today and kind of just 